Hello and welcome to Lecture 2, Week 2 on the Renaissance and Reformation, Chapter 17 in your uh, textbook. I have some important things I want to tell you to look for in the chapter and also to mention some things that aren't actually mentioned directly in the chapter but you should be uh, aware of. So uh, take part in these discussion board, the discussion boards that are up there now. Later there'll be uh, the quiz two will be uh, posted for you. And we're moving right along but still keeping the theme of globalization, the world. The first thing about the Renaissance is what was it? Well, it means rebirth. Uh, one thing that to to uh, keep in mind is that for most of history before this point, Europe wasn't very important in terms of the entire globe, right? Most of the big civilizations, if you take ever take History 110 with me or another professor here on campus, you'll learn a lot about ancient China, ancient Africa, even the ancient Middle East. You'll learn about the Ottoman Empire, which we learned about last week. But you won't necessarily have a lot of focus on Europe because most civilization there was pretty small uh, and a small scale with the exception of the Roman and Greek empires in ancient history. Uh, so for about 100 years prior to this in what we call the medieval period, uh, there was not a lot going on there. Most of the uh, civilization there was feudal civilization, small feudal kingdoms in uh, small estates, not very large kingdoms. Uh, well, that begins to change in uh, the 14 and 1500s uh, with the Renaissance and with the rebirth. The rest of the world didn't have a Renaissance at this time because they didn't have to have a rebirth because they were already humming along quite, quite nicely, uh, China, Africa, and places like that. But this is a time when Europe tends to be catching up with the rest of the world and we're trying to understand why that is. You know, look at Guns, Germs, and Steel, that documentary that I assigned to you that we're going to be talking more of, about. That's going to give you part of the answer. Understanding how the Renaissance uh, comes to Italy first and then spreads to the rest of Europe is also really important uh, too. And the first of all, we should know, I want to point out something that's not directly in your textbook, not in your textbook, is that remember when we talked about the fall of Constantinople last week by the Ottoman Empire? Well, think of those Christians that are still there, the priests and the scribes, those sort of educated church people, to what we call the clergy. Some of them actually flee, excuse me, some of them flee and escape, um, kind of refugees, immigrants, and some of them go to Italy, and right? And they bring their learning with them and their books with, with them. You know, these refugees, you might call them from Constantinople, uh, coming to Italy actually bring classic knowledge, ancient knowledge about the ancient Greek philosophers with them to, uh, to Rome. The Romans, Romans had been un unaware of people like the philosopher Plato. Okay, so they're coming from Constantinople. Uh, that's an influence uh, um, that helps to start the Renaissance. Uh, also, global trade in, increased exposure to other cultures. You know, the places where the Renaissance was strongest uh, was Genoa, was Venice, was Milan. Those are all places in Italy that were touched profoundly by global trade. And they're also interacting, even though there's a lot of warfare between the, the Habsburg and Ottoman empires, which we studied last week, there's also a lot of exposure to the ideas and the technologies of the Ottoman empire and other uh, worlds. Uh, so uh, keep that in mind as well. Humanism is the key term to understand. This is the ability and the confidence of humans in their own skills to create wonderful, beautiful things. Think of it sort of as the rise of more secular forms of artwork that wasn't always religion. Uh, and if you look at medieval art, and earlier forms of art, for example, uh, God and angels always play a large role in, in that artwork. A lot of the plays that were um, in the public eye prior to the Renaissance would have been we call passion plays or morality plays about religion and uh, uh, and biblical themes. Um, that's changing. There'll still be biblical themes in the Renaissance. There's still quite uh, religious and devout people. Uh, but often humankind will be at the center of the art, right? Humanism uh, is, and, and something to be humanist is an emphasis on the creative ability of humankind. 
uh, to explore the full range of the human experience. You see it in um, poetry, in painting, uh, you see it in um, other other forms of art, um, like those uh, ceilings painted on chapels, uh, Michelangelo, and um, that host of Italian artists that uh, became so famous during their time and afterwards as well. So the Renaissance uh, has to do with art, um, has to do with humanism, has to do with human confidence, uh, and this also gives way to the, the, this curiosity about the world to the age of exploration, which we all ch also mentioned uh, last week. We talked about the spices as well, that first kind of global trade in global commodities, things gathered from around the world. Uh, so we talked about Christopher Columbus, Vasco da Gama last week. This is still the age of, uh, of exploration, but as they become more and more exposed to outside ideas, they begin taking those ideas back home uh, and um, developing their own sort of twists on uh, on um, on um, artwork, on technology, uses of technology, of the compass, of the astrolabe that they're borrowing from other cultures. Another thing that helps the, the Renaissance along and actually helps the Reformation, the other big theme for this meet, the religious uh, uh, side of uh, of history during this time. The other thing that is vitally important is a man by the name of Johannes Gutenberg. Johannes Gutenberg. He develops the Gutenberg uh, press, printing press, uh, and the famous Gutenberg Bible. Uh, it's hard to imagine the Reformation happening at this time. Uh, again, some of this was borrowed technology um, that they use for the printing press, but they put it all together. And what they have is um, a machine with moving text, moving type. It's nothing like our printer, modern printers, colored printers today, but it did allow you to, to produce books at a much, much cheaper cost. Uh, so before this, books were extremely expensive. Only the very wealthy uh, had books. And to create beautiful books, people, uh, scribes and, and many of the people who created books uh, prior to the uh, Reformation were monks and priests, you know, in monasteries who had a lot of time. It, it could take a couple of years for a monk to uh, reproduce a, a, a copy or two of a book. Can you imagine how expensive that would be? So now come along the printing press and suddenly, um, with this machine, you're able to, uh, to, to, to print out large numbers of, of pamphlets and even books um, in a short period of time for a relatively uh, cheap cost. Uh, this is an IT revolution, information technology revolution. It puts information more and more into the hands of everyday people. Now, most people still can't read, but information is still uh, vitally important. Uh, and this um, is going to head, uh, help to spread uh, religious ideas, and even religious ideas that went against the formal, official teaching of the Catholic Church. And this is 1517, the year that will stand out in history when Martin Luther posts his 95 theses and 95 different problems that he had with the, uh, the Catholic Church. And foremost amongst those was the practice of indulgences. Uh, this was the practice of the church of, of um, people paying for their deceased loved ones uh, to go to heaven in the afterlife. You know, it was kind of a corrupt practice um, and now during the Renaissance, they're emphasizing more and more human understanding and, and, and uh, reading. And, you know, monks like, and, and uh, Martin, Martin Luther was a priest himself, so I think he started out as a monk and then a, a priest. Um, he, he says, you know, I don't find anything in the Bible about something like indulgences. Why are we doing it? There's a re and this goes back to the Renaissance emphasis of, of, the, um, of the Reformation as well, that emphasis on understanding the ancient um, uh, Christianity, just as uh, the people during the Renaissance, the artisan that were interested in ancient Roman 
uh, and Greek art, so too Martin Luther and reforming uh, Christians are interested in ancient Christianity uh, before it had been institutionalized by the church itself and that many of them felt had become more and more corrupt. Now, um, think about this period as this period as almost a religious civil war. The Reformation of the 1500s is nothing but war and more war between the various uh, uh, groups, religious groups. And there is a splintering of religious uh, uh, groups at this time across this region, many of which you can still see within the, the, the different denominations of Christianity today. And I like to describe it as um, the, the beginning of the modern Christian spectrum of beliefs. So a spectrum is like a half circle, right? So if you have a, a one side of the spectrum, the more conservative side, you have the Catholic faith and the Catholic uh, 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 religion. This had been the, uh, the main religion in Western Europe um, for about a thousand years. Um, and it's the most conservative. It's where they have seven sacraments. Uh, priests can't uh, can't marry. Uh, but right next to that, not too far away in beliefs, and that was the, the the Church of England, founded by Henry the Eighth of England. He doesn't change the church too much. This is the story of Henry the Eighth and his six wives. Right? He wants a divorce from the from the Catholic Church. Uh, the Pope denies it. Uh, Henry VIII kind of looks around, you might say, metaphorically looks around Europe, right? And he says, well, there's a lot of religious chaos and a lot of, lot of kingdoms are breaking away from the Catholic Church, such as Lutherans, for example, Luther, German Lutherans were, were had broken away from the church. Maybe I should break away the way church, of, the, of the church too, so I can control it better. He does it really for more political reasons. And therefore, he doesn't change the church in theology and its beliefs very much from Catholicism. So in that spectrum of beliefs, then there's there's Catholicism on the conservative side, then there's uh, Anglicanism or the Church of England. That's not too far away from Catholicism because it looks fairly similar at that time. It doesn't change the stained glass windows, the cathedrals. Uh, um, he will allow priests eventually to marry in that, but it doesn't look a whole lot different than Catholicism. Then there's Lutheranism in the middle. I, I put in the middle that spectrum of beliefs founded by Martin Luther. Um, many kings choose, especially in the central part of Europe and what is today Germany, many of those princes and kings that are in control of those kingdoms, they say, well, you know, if I had control over the church, that would increase my wealth. And I'm more sympathetic with uh, um, the, the followers of Martin Luther as well and, and their ideas of um, religion through emphasis on Christianity's emphasis on faith and not not just works alone. So that's the, the Lutheran faith. I call that kind of the moderate Protestantism. Protestants are all those who broke away from the Catholic Church. Then on the far end, on the more radical end of, of uh, uh, the Christian spectrum of beliefs, are the Anabaptists, the Calvinists, followers of John Calvin, and the Anabaptists. These are kind of related to um, what we might some today see as um, um, uh, Christian conservatives, uh, Southern Baptists, Puritans, right, uh, who want to purify the earth. Methodists come out uh, of this tradition uh, as well. Um, John Calvin believed in the doctrine of predestination, for example. God was so all-powerful according to Calvin and his followers that he knew at the beginning, you know, just by looking at, at all of the earth's history at once, who was predestined for good and bad, right, for salvation and non-salvation. That's kind of uh, um, John Calvin's take on it. Anabaptists emphasize faith so much uh, that they 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 don't even see baptism as that important, right? They believe that faith alone is important, and that's the kind of most radical of the Christian beliefs at that time. I just call it radical because it it, it broke with the past in the most visible and stark way. So that's that's the 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 um, religious traditions that are born at this time. And uh, England is a place where you find, obviously, the Anglican Church and the Church of England. Uh, the Catholic faith then still con continues to flourish in 
places in southern Europe, in Italy, in Spain, places like that, and is brought to uh, the Americas as well by Spanish explorers, missionaries, and, uh, and traders. The other, the last thing that I want to talk to you about, about chapter 17, is the Spanish Armada and the global struggle between Great Britain and Spain. See, Great Britain had broken away from Spain, uh, from, from the Catholic Church, I mean, under Hinder VIII, and uh, that Habsburg em Emperor Philip II, he really is irritated by that um, renegade country, England, up north, and he wants to bring it back into the Catholic fold of nations. So he had actually been married to a, a, um, a queen of England, a Catholic queen, uh, um, daughter of Henry VIII, who tried to bring England back to Catholicism, uh, only to die young. Uh, in 1558, uh, uh, Elizabeth the uh, uh, first takes the throne uh, of, uh, of England. She's a Protestant. Philip of Spain has it in for Elizabeth. Sends a, a huge fleet in 1588. I mean, a, a mother of all fleets, if I can use that kind of expression, um, of about 300 vessels, something like that, and uh, big. Spanish galleons. It's actually defeated uh, largely because of bad weather, good luck on this part of the English, and the English have smaller, faster uh, uh, boats and uh, more accurate guns. So uh, the, the Spanish Armada comes limping home in defeat if, if, the, if the sailors come home at all. A lot of the ships are lost, uh, and the Spanish Armada is a disaster. Now that's more though of a metaphorical defeat for the Spanish than a military defeat in the in the, in the long run because, yeah, it was a big military defeat, uh, but it shows more the, the the growing weakness of Spain and the strength of Great Britain for the future and, and the Great Britain and Queen Elizabeth and later kings and queens of England will point to that victory as a turning point in their history. But in fact, in fact, the, the Spanish uh, um, will remain powerful around the world into the 1600s, but they will begin to decline when compared to Great Britain that is growing uh, in the 16 and 1700s. Why is that? A couple of quick reasons to put down in your notes. Because Spain didn't invest a lot of its money back into uh, industry and things that could make it more money. Uh, because Great Britain and uh, other countries like France and um, uh, the Netherlands, these other European countries, were investing a lot in these new uh, forms of economic, um, these new economic commodities such as sugar, coffee, uh, which are fast economic growth, and even in the slave trade uh, as well. Uh, and um, Spain doesn't have that kind of dynamic growth. Okay, so I'm going to leave it there. That's a lot of information to go over. Um, most of it's in your uh, textbook, and I will have follow-up questions on these themes in our discussion this week. Best of luck. Let me know if you have any questions. Talk to you soon. Um, anyway, good, but I have to get emails. Items view.